Hey, it's Justin Harvey. Thanks for tuning in to the Anesthesia Success Podcast, where we take a close look at important topics pertaining to business, practice management, personal finance, and careers for anesthesiologists and pain management physicians. On this show, I work hard to take your critical questions straight to the experts. Thanks for listening. This week, I had a great conversation with Dr. Josh Suderman. We talked about prior auths and the impact that they have in the pain management infrastructure for physicians, for patients, the delays that they cause, the reasons that they exist, and some of the work legislatively that's being done right now in the state of Michigan to be able to reform the prior auth process, to be able to make it less onerous for everyone involved. So as always, thanks for tuning in. Hello and welcome to episode 36 of the Anesthesia Success Podcast. I'm very pleased to be joined today by Dr. Joshua Suderman. Josh is an anesthesiology and pain boarded physician at the Javery Pain Institute in Grand Rapids, Michigan. He's joining me today to talk about his experience in treating pain in the context of a smaller pain practice. We're also going to tackle the topic of prior authorizations, what they are, why they happen, and Josh's work to make prior auths less of a problem for both patients and physicians. Josh, thanks for joining us today. Hey, thanks for the opportunity. Really looking forward to it. So tell us a little bit about your current practice uh, there in Michigan. So in Michigan, uh, we're an independent private pain management clinic. We have two physicians, uh, two nurse practitioners, and a physician's assistant. Uh, We have about 50 staff members. Uh, We do office-based procedures, manage medications, uh, and coordinate multidisciplinary plans, physical therapy, pain psychology. Got it. You said 50, 5, 0 staff members? Yes. That's a, a lot. Pain management is a very overhead heavy specialty. We have to have a lot of staff to prepare patients for many surgeries, meaning their interventional procedures, look after them after the procedure. Uh, So it's a lot of overhead, but it gives the opportunity to make a lot of good relationships with staff. And, you know, the patients, they meet all of us. The physicians are important, but the whole staff helps to care for the patient. And uh, we're a close-knit family. Absolutely. So how long have you been practicing it at this, uh, in this current location? So Javery Pain Institute, I've been here a little over five years, August of 2014 Okay, when awesome. I started. And that was your first job out of fellowship? Yeah. Yeah, it was. Uh, I, I remember hearing uh, Dr. Deer on one of your recent episodes. He said, you know, I've only had one job and that's kind of okay. unique for a, any career. Yeah. Uh, I sure hope to keep it that way. It has been my first job. I was a pain medicine fellow at the University of Michigan. Prior to that, I was an anesthesia resident there. I uh, did my medical school in Virginia, and um, actually before medical school, I was an orderly in a hospital. I was oh, okay. an operating room technician, handing instruments to surgeons, oh. uh, and, and you know, prior to that, finished up college, but those are great experiences to shape my medical career as well. Yeah, absolutely. So what what would you say is the focus or the the you know specific expertise at, at the Javery Pain Institute? Sure. Our focus really is patient-centered. You know, we take the time, we make the effort to develop that deep personal connection with patients, especially in regards to pain management. You know, that's the most common reason people see a doctor, but yet primary care physicians are really overburdened. So we want to be that outlet where the patient comes and they're listened to. Every new patient sees the physician only on their first visit. So we establish that connection. And then throughout the follow-up period, months, maybe years, our team collaborates. And it's just a personal connection because we walk with pain likely for the rest of someone's life. It's the diagnosis in and of itself. And so our specialty is really just developing that connection and then applying those multidisciplinary tools to manage their pain in a personal way. Got it. And so it sounds like you were pretty lucky to land at a place where you're really happy from the beginning. I think that is an uncommon experience. So I'm curious, as you were going through the process of wrapping up fellowship, trying to make some connections in the industry, trying to figure out, you know, you've been in academics all the Mm -hmm. way up to that point, and you're Mm -hmm. about to make a jump into a different type of practice model. How did did you feel prepared to be able to make that decision? And what kind of resources were you drawing upon in order to do that? Right. I think looking back, no one ever feels as prepared as they would like to be to make a decision about a job. Uh, Just like anything in life, uh, choosing a major in college or becoming a parent or, you know, major decisions, you never feel prepared. And looking back, you're like, oh my goodness, I knew nothing. But I had great alumni from the University of Michigan to rely on, people in private practice pain management. Um, I actually found a contract lawyer in the Mm -hmm. town where I was working at, and she kind of helped put some perspective on the contract I was looking at. And, you know, in the end, I'm just grateful that I'm here. Um, I'm a man of faith. And so I think there was a higher power involved in putting me here. And I feel really, really lucky uh, to be where I'm at today. 
That's great. Um, so talk a little bit about, you know, the topic at hand. And the reason I reached out to you is I saw some of the work that you were doing with regards to advocacy in legislation surrounding prior authorizations. So mm -hmm. talk to me like I'm a third grader for a minute and just mm -hmm. talk about what is a prior authorization? Why do we have them? And why is it such a, I mean, for pain management, it's like a pretty, it's an important part of your practice, unfortunately. So talk about sort of how that all came to be. Sure. So prior authorization is a process where we have to submit a treatment plan to be approved by your insurance company before we can get payment for your treatment. It's a cost control mechanism where it's reviewed prior to then allowing the provider to provide that treatment. Uh, and so in pain medicine, some of the procedures we do are fairly costly. And it's, it takes a lot of investment to manage something that's with a patient 24-7 for years throughout their life. It's not as easy as just taking a pill for a number like blood pressure, which the patient doesn't even know about, right? They know about pain every single moment of their life. So it takes a lot of investment to manage that. And so prior authorization just means prior to the treatment proposed, you're getting an authorization to do it. Although, as some papers are pointing out, it's still not a guarantee for payment. And the insurance companies still can deny payment even though they've authorized it, which is a whole new wrinkle in this ever evolving process that's come up recently. Wow, I don't think I would have even known that. So maybe you can take this concept and apply it to you know, a, just a, a little case study. Tell me about a recent instance when you had to do a prior off and how all that unfolded. Sure. Uh, a recent instance is actually 100% of the time. If I need to do a spinal procedure and a patient's insurance company uses the prior authorization process, I have to say, if I want to do an epidural, please give me authorization. And we allow three weeks, unfortunately, uh, to wait for that. That's the typical time frame, And that means that if I want to treat sciatica, meaning back pain going down your leg from a disc problem, uh, I have to wait three weeks, no matter how much pain you're in. Uh, and I have to be able to say that, okay, I'm going to ask for this. I'm hoping it will happen. And I have to then put in my note, if I don't think you could tolerate physical therapy, um, I don't want to prescribe it because you're in too much pain. If I don't think an x-ray is going to give me information that I can act on clinically versus an MRI, which shows me much more detail, then I have to explain that. And we have to wait for that to go through the rigmarole of often Timbuktu, Iowa, somewhere with someone who may or may not have a medical degree to approve that based on an algorithm that wasn't developed for you, it was developed across the board, and then maybe we can treat you. Right. So I was describing it before we got on this call. I had a recent experience with prior auths, and it's so funny. I keep having this experience as a patient, <laughs> and then I interview somebody about this. But I was having an issue with my back, and there was a, a mild uh, disc herniation. And so I yes. was... Uh, having a lot of pain, finally went to the doctor. I thought it was muscular at first and it just the pain kept sticking around and it was radiating around at the front. Yeah. And I was like, ah, oh, this feels weird. So I went to the my yeah. family practice doc. They were able to get me in on short notice and I was about to leave town. So right now I'm in central Oregon mm -hmm. with my uh, my in-laws and I was going to we're, we're going to be here for weeks. So I had to get treatment done before I left town and uh, the doctor recommended an MRI. And she said, <laughs> I think, I think you need an MRI, except I know that we're going to probably need a prior auth. And in order to get the prior auth, we might need to do an x-ray first. So it's basically, she, it was clear to me, she had been down this road before. So she's like, yes. here's the end point, And here's the hurdles mm -hmm. we may have to face between here and there. So I need you to go get an x-ray as part of the prior authorization process. Cause they're not going to let me give you an MRI until you've had a negative x-ray first, potentially. Mm -hmm. So I went and mm -hmm. got the x-ray, and she, the, my physician was very responsive. And I was actually able to get this done in a pretty short amount of time, such that I went to the yeah. doctor on Wednesday, got the x-ray on Thursday, got the MRI on Friday, and then left town Saturday morning. Yeah. So it just so happened that in my instance, in order to get the MRI, it, it worked out. But it's not yeah. hard for me to imagine. Oh, go ahead. Yeah. But, but you know what, though? I think it didn't work out. And I think it's not working out because if you look at that scenario, why is this a cost saving measure to make you go through hundreds of dollars of an x-ray that isn't going to change clinical decision making? Yeah. Why should you have to wait for that step therapy if it's not going to change a single thing your doctor is going to do? And this entity that is the prior authorization company says, oh, you know, well, we're going to save costs. How are they saving costs for any of that um, when 
the your age, I mean, this is evidence. Your age, it's a disc problem. 30 to 50, we know that discs are the first problem that go and they cause pain going down your leg. It's probably L4 the way you described it. And we know that an MRI is actionable evidence to do something about it. That's evidence-based. The need to get an x-ray first or make you go through six weeks of physical therapy, that's not evidence-based. And that rarely works for patients when I can treat them with the procedure. Yeah. And I can only imagine if you took a more extreme version of my issue where it's like, I was in significant pain. It wasn't like sure. debilitating, but I was very uncomfortable to the point where mm -hmm. I could barely buckle my seatbelt in my car when mm -hmm. I'm driving. Or ride in uh, an airplane to Oregon. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, that's right. So I can imagine if it was something more uh, acute and if Here's the prior off takes longer, it's, it's, but it's for you, brutal. it was acute. <laughs> For you, it was acute, right? Yeah, I mean, right. that was you. you this I is, try to be a tough a guy, of, so. <laughs> well, sure, sure. Our, our, we are. A lot of us try to be. Yeah. But that's your function. That's your life. You can't yeah. support yourself in the way that you could or slash be safe in a car buckling a seatbelt if you can't get treatment. And why put the requirement for cost increasing on a patient in time? Because time is the most valuable resource. So yeah, absolutely. Backwards. So, you know, from a cost containment standpoint, this would be the rationale from an insurance company mm -hmm. is that sure. we're going to have all these doctors who don't have skin in the game. Like they're not paying for this. They're just saying, go get this thing, this scan, this mm -hmm. treatment that may cost thousands or maybe tens of thousands of dollars. Uh, and they don't have enough uh, of a check to, to push back against times at which that might not be appropriate. And therefore, we, the prior auth committee of this insurance company, wants to review because we, the insurance company, are going to be footing the bill for this thing. We want to make sure that it seems mm -hmm. like it makes sense. So mm -hmm. I'm curious to hear, you know, what's the, what's the response to that? Right. So that's the common verbiage in, in the lay press. And every single part of that statement is actually 180 degrees backwards. So first of all, this is not done for cost containment because the insurance companies have got wind of that. And I was at a hearing in Lansing, our capital here in Michigan, where an insurance company talked with senators and they said the word cost containment zero times. They said this is for to ensure safety. This is to guard against outliers who are going to overutilize the system. If that's the case and it's not cost containment, then why am I required to do this every single time for procedures that have been done for decades on millions of people and are very safe? So it's not, you know, it is cost containment. And it is that, first of all. And I've actually talked with another insurance group here in town and said, yeah, yeah, it is. They admit it. So the burden of price actually does fall significantly on the provider in an indirect way. Cleveland Clinic in 2017, they spent over $10 million of their own money doing this. The healthcare system providers are hundreds to billions of dollars over one to two years based on CAQH. It's a nonprofit alliance that looks at this data. Every prior auth costs almost 20 bucks. And that's footed by me because I'm paying staff right below me as the vice president part owner of this company to process these. And it's been shown that one provider takes two to three FTEs of people to process this. Henry Ford Health System is here in Detroit. They have over a hundred people just doing prior auths. Insurance company isn't footing that bill. We are. So if the insurance company is concerned about footing the bill, take this out and then don't make me order useless tests that are going to cost you money. And when I want to do a spinal procedure, don't make me prescribe six weeks of physical therapy, which certainly costs more than an epidural. And finally, I'm required to order an MRI annually without clinical indication. They just say, we need an MRI every year if we're going to authorize another treatment. There's no indication for that. And they can't do procedures in your neck and low back on the same day if you have arthritis in both. So the patient's coming back, not bundling, paying for both procedures 100%, and their driver and them are both missing work. That's economic cost. Absolutely. So talk about the, the uh, experience at uh, the Javery Pain Institute. What kinds of, you know, you just described it a little bit, what kinds of infrastructure uh, in terms of staff systems, you know, the form emails that you send is like, well, we're going to send this email, then this is going to come back and then we're going to send that email. Like describe what you've had to do in order to deal with this. Yeah. You know, boy, it'd be nice if it could be emailed, but so often it's faxes just like in 1985. Yeah. Uh, so that was a good year, 1985. <laughs> yeah, I was, it was like, two you know? years old. <laughs> boy, back to the future. Wouldn't that be great? Well, not in this instance. Right. Um, yeah. So the big thing here now is, wow, well, we're going to make this all electronic. 
um, that doesn't matter. I still have staff on the phone for hours at a time waiting to get in touch with someone electronically to process this. So yeah. we have a billing department of five to seven people uh, with two physicians and two of those people are working on prior auth only. Uh, wow. And so we're a little clinic, but you know, I guess that means we got job security for, for people in the, in the community here and we can feel yeah. good about that, but it sure costs a lot. And we have a billing department though that's trained to really hone in on these pain management practices um, our billing department coordinator has been doing this for 30 years. So they know how to get these through and we know how to preemptively document. So the things I was saying to you, I put that in my note. If you were my patient, I would put in my note, Justin needs this MRI and this treatment because your clinical history, your age group, your symptoms. And I believe this is the best indicated treatment rather than step therapy. Right. So does, does prior authorization and the headaches associated with it, does it vary by payer? or by yeah. insurance company, or talk a little bit about that. Oh yeah, oh yeah, everyone in our clinic down to the medical assistant, probably even the front desk, we have flags on the chart. We know when it's a prior auth insurance. And so um, there are third party companies, for-profit companies, one of them called Evacore, E-V-I-C-O-R-E, who contract with not-for-profit companies, like maybe a Blue Cross or whomever, Ascension, I don't know if Ascension's you know, not-for-profit, but somebody else, and Evacor, the for-profit company, gives them the guidelines for cost savings. So then we know, oh, that policy is governed by Evacor. So now we know it's going to be a totally different conversation with that patient, and we're not going to be able to offer as timely of care as we could with other insurance companies. Um, Medicare is great. We don't need prior auth for them. Imagine that, a government insurance company <laughs> being more easy or easier to deal with than commercial. Um, but not all in commercial insurance companies are governed, governed by a prior auth process. It depends on who they've contracted with. Got it. And then do the prior auth requirements vary? Because I know insurance is regulated at the state level, I think. I don't know if it's the same with health insurance. Is that Does the prior auth requirement vary by state, do you know? Yeah, so we're actually working with that here in Michigan. Senate Bill 612 um, is here, and we, we worked with this uh, last week at that hearing. Um, they do have ways to govern how commercial insurance carriers do this. So one of the big things is prohibit an insurance, an insurer from requiring that an insured persons uh, participate in a step therapy protocol. So they have the power to say, you can't do that in this state. Now, in general, state um, legislatures have more control over Medicaid dollars, um, but we don't see a lot of straight Medicaid because it's somewhat transient the way it's where, you know, you got to get on then they want you to get off and, you know, do more in life and all that. It's a big debate, you know, in this country yeah. in general. So there is some control over that, um, uh, at the state level. Okay. So talk about your, uh, what's happening in your home state. Cause obviously in Michigan, this has been, it's a legislative front burner item that's happening in mm -hmm. real time right now. Yes. And you've been involved yes. in that public discourse. So talk about what is the state of affairs and what have you been doing? Well, we're lucky. Um, Senator Vanderwall is the chair of this committee. Uh, he's really listened to physicians. And our state medical society, the Michigan State Medical Society, has created an, an initiative. It's a Health Can't Wait. And so if you go to healthcantwait.org, that really summarizes our efforts here in Michigan. Uh, there's a lot of good information there. And basically, we want transparency, right? We want to ensure that if we're getting a denial, that we're talking with a doctor who's licensed and board certified in our specialty. Yeah. I've had to talk with internists and radiologists about why I need to do certain treatment plans. And a radiologist has never seen a patient in their life, right? So how can they tell me as a pain management doctor what I should be doing? Um, other parts of this, as I said, if step therapy doesn't apply to you, then the doctor needs to document why and then be approved for that. Um, and then if there's going to be changes, hey, we need to know about that beforehand and they need to be in an easily accessible place online basic things that we've got since 1995. We've got this thing called the internet where people can go on and they can look at things pretty easily, should be able to see that and process this pretty quickly. So these are basic things we're asking for in 2020 and I'm hoping it makes some progress. Great. Do you have a sense for where Michigan stands in terms of like how uh, progressive it is as far as like enacting some of these policies? Um, I have not talked with other state legislatures I think, as you mentioned, this is a front burner issue. And I think a lot of people are just getting into this because in our field, so much of it has been the opioid epidemic for so long. Yeah. Um, I have not got a sense from our state medical society about the AMA national level feel of this, but the AMA at a national level is pushing 
these same issues um, and prerogatives. So it's happening nationally. I don't know state to state as well. And we've got, a, we've got our hands full here. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. Um, so there was that article in the, the Detroit News, which I, I cited uh, in the, the first email that I sent you, and we'll, we'll link to in the show notes. So for our listeners, anesthesiasuccess.com slash 36, we'll link to um, some of the great work that Josh has been doing and some of the sources we're going to discuss here. So the Detroit News um, had this stat that it was something like 97% of uh, prior first prior auth requests ended up being approved. So 97 out of 100. Correct. And so, Correct. you know, what does that what does that tell you as you're looking at mm-hmm. the landscape here? So that should inform what we talked about a few minutes ago. Um, your listeners now know the state of affairs in that this is not a safety issue or an outlier issue. This is cost containment. So if you really feel that we aren't doing the right thing by cost or safety or outlier, then why are we approved 97% of the time? And here's the answer. It's because we're asking for routine care to be authorized. Yeah. Uh, transferaminal epidural steroid injection, right? This is a procedure that's been around for decades. It's something I've done thousands of times in my short career. I do it every day. And so the reason it's approved that much is because we're required 100% of the time to submit this off. And I guess there's 3% of the time where someone doesn't need I don't know what that would include. I would hope as a pain management certified specialist, I could tell when they need this most common procedure. That's the reason is it's not for out of this world, crazy things. It's everyday care that now all of a sudden has this other layer between the patient and the physician. And that sacred relationship doesn't get to make the call between patient patient and physician any longer. Yeah. Another stat cited here was that there was an AMA survey that said 28% of physicians reported that prior auths had resulted in a serious adverse event, including hospitalization, permanent disability, or death. So that's another one of those startling, like prior auths are literally, it sounds like literally killing people. Yes. So in my world, I treat elective problems, right? We're in, a, we're in an office out on an, in an office park. Um, so I am lucky in that I don't deal with life or death, life or death situations. I can't speak to that personally. Um, but what I can speak to is that patients see pain that way. <laughs> yeah. People see pain as life or death and they're not going to be able to do the things. And so if you think about adverse events, well, that person who has to deal with it for three weeks beyond what I could normally treat it, meaning the same day I meet them, Um, That's certainly an adverse event. And that gets into some of the other statistics where, you know, a majority of physicians believe this has led to delaying of care and even abandonment. uh, Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I can imagine in my own situation, if if it hadn't been that I could get the MRI literally on the day before I was going to be out of town for three weeks. And now I'm in central Oregon where I don't have access to any of my normal sort of medical infrastructure. I would probably just be taking lots of ibuprofen for the next month and And hoping that by the time I get home, it doesn't hurt anymore. (laughs) And here's where it leads into the opioid epidemic, because if I can't get authorization for opioid sparing treatments, then how, what am I being asked for? Well, you know, doc, what can you do in the meantime, right? Well, what can you give me today? Um, Well, you know, I'd like to be able to do this procedure because it works. um, And I can put medicine directly at the source of the problem. Uh, But today I can't. And this gets back to kind of that historical thing with, you know, advocacy. You know, I noticed even before prior off that insurance company formula make it so easy to write opioid medications like dilaudid, fentanyl, morphine, hydrocodone, and they don't give me access to newer use of medications like buprenorphine, which is a safer opioid medication. And so that's in parallel, and they just feed off each other. If I can't treat you now, then you're going to be asking me for things that I feel are unsafe, and then you're going to think that you can't trust me as a patient, and then where's the trust, where's the relationship, and there's an adverse event. I don't know where you go to get your care any longer because I can't give you care. Right. Talk a little bit about how, how did you begin to get involved in the advocacy side of things? And if sure. somebody else out there is listening who's like, prior auths are making me pull out all of my hair and punch holes in right. the wall, and I want to do literally whatever I can to try to push back against this, how yes. do I start to take that first step? Sure. My history, um, when I started out, um, Medicare started to put some restrictions on epidural injections, uh, and they were just blanket restrictions. You can only do this much at a time. Um, and some physicians would agree with it. Some wouldn't, it was just the fact that, oh my goodness, like I wasn't, I didn't see this in the ivory tower of academics. Uh, you can't do what I think you should do. Hmm. So I just emailed our LCD. Um, we, there's different regions of Medicare in this country. So I emailed them and started talking with them. Um, and then the opioid formulary issue, uh, spurred me on as well. And so what I've done is I've really just taken it on myself to contact my lawmakers over and over and over again. I got a few of them to visit our clinic. I went up to this hearing in Lansing. Um, 
And then through my state medical society, I'm really fortunate that uh, we've got things like this Health Can't Wait initiative. They can plug me into lawmakers as well. I've tried talking with insurance companies. and I've met with other pain groups in town, and we actually sat across the table from them. It was just not productive. Uh, this you know, third-party company was there in between us and the insurance company. And we were literally told um, at one of these other meetings as well, you know, we're we're a guideline company. We do guidelines. We don't do patient outcomes or satisfaction. So that kind of shut me down. I'm like, well, that's a wall I can't really bark up anymore, you know, yeah. or try and climb up if that's their view of it. So, um, you know, it's really been advocacy through legislation and then getting in touch with other doctors who have the same uh, issues. So you mentioned the Health Can't Wait initiative in Michigan. Tell me a little bit more about that. Sure. This is born out of the Michigan State Medical Society. And this initiative is specifically for prior authorization. So, you know, the American Medical Association, kind of the parent uh, association of Michigan State, really brought this to our attention. And then people in Michigan verified that, hey, we're having these problems. That's right, here in Michigan. And so this is a coalition of dozens, literally dozens of different organizations here in Michigan. You got all these logos here from physical therapists to radiologists. Um, we've got anesthesiologists, the Diabetes Association, Cancer Action Network, um, a different county medical society, Sickle Cell Disease of America, Susan G. Komen. So all of these groups, patient advocacy groups, physician groups, all see the problem with prior auth. And this initiative has given them a common avenue to uh, address those concerns. So if there's such broad-based uh, support, why... Why does this, why, I mean, there's a number of places in healthcare where this question would apply, uh, and it's a little bit rhetorical, but why sure. is it taking so long and why is it so hard? The stat is right, right there, 97% of first prior auth requests get approved. That says, like, statistically, only one, three out of 100 would ever even get denied. And is it right. not worth letting three out of 100 perhaps slip through to a more progressive treatment if we can, you know, get rid of a whole department worth of people that are just generating a bunch of work that delays patient care. Does that not make sense? It does. And I agree with your hands going everywhere and you getting exasperated <laughs> for people who are just listening here. That was a great explanation. I'm going to call you out on that, Justin, because it looked great. It, it totally reflects patients, physicians, providers, feelings on this. Um, the answer is, you know what? We're not in control. Uh, the way our health system was allowed to develop, uh, the insurance companies control this. And it was interesting. There, there's a vision. There's a picture in my mind. When I went to the Senate building in Lansing, and I walked up to, I was walking in the door and I looked kind of up and behind it. And I saw there was this other big, larger gray building towering over this Senate building. And the logo on that building was a national insurance carrier. We literally right next door connected. And that shows you how in the midst of this Senate building, it's being dwarfed and hovered over by an insurance carrier. And that is, I think is a good example of where we stand. And, and, and that's why and we need patient voices is the first and foremost, because that's the most powerful thing here. Uh, and that's starting to happen. And I think that's where we can bring this change about. Um, also, we need collaboration. And I can bemoan insurance companies all I want. But until I can provide a solution and work with them on that solution, I'm not doing the responsible thing here. So you're getting background in my frustrations. But, you know, doctors want to be at the table. They want to sit with their patients as they did in front of those senators and talk about this and come up with a solution so that we can kind of bring our hands back in and stop pulling out our hair, as you said, uh, right. and get down to business and make healthcare better. Do you feel like the physician organizations, advocacy groups, are, are they doing a good job right now? Are they doing an adequate job of exerting influence in this direction? Or are they maybe spread too thin? Or are there other mm -hmm. issues? Or do, do you see this as an area where there needs to be more focus? Yes, this needs to be more focused. Listen, we as physicians, we're trained to care for patients. We don't learn advocacy. We don't learn business. And those are the levels where decisions are made politically for the care that we deliver. And traditionally, it's just because we haven't done a good job of getting involved because we're maxed out on giving away the 20s and 30s of our life learning to care for patients. Right. So we need to do a better job. It's not because we aren't trying, but we need to, we need to get doctors trained. Um, I would love to share my story and, and my success stories and what I'm learning both in you know administrative and advocacy roles because that determines what we can do and that's just the reality of it uh, we can't just you know say what we need for our patient and expect that to be authorized and there's some good in that we should learn population health we should learn what it means to get a good staff around you and then treat that pain with evidence-based practices best practices when they're available and so 
doctors are okay with that. We're not scared of that, but this is, it's not working and uh, we need to do better than prior authorization allows us to do. So I know for a fact that there are other, um, there's physicians and state societies and some of the national organizations listening to this probably right now. Good. And you, you have their ears. So what do you want to tell them as far as how do physicians work together to be able to care for patients in sort of modifying the current prior auth environment to make it more friendly for treatment? Right. Get yourselves together in your state, right? Come up with reasonable demands that are based on evidence, based on patient stories. Um, go to your state society or go and or go to your legislators. Talk to them about this. They want to hear from you. You're their constituent as well as your patients are. And, and, and make them aware of these issues. Band together. And then me, I'm kind of in the middle. I'm not starting off on this, but I'm also not an expert. So those of you out there who have experience with this, if you're further on in your career and have seen, um, please, please, please give to us coming behind you to empower us to say, hey, you know what, as physicians, we haven't been able to do this. This is where I've seen that it uh, could have been done better. Um, and find some young doctors, you know, maybe like myself, maybe I'll pat myself on the back a little bit, who are anxious to do this and have some zeal for it and who are willing to take a clinic day and go up to Lansing or your capital, wherever it is, um, and, and talk with uh, legislators. We need to collaborate. We need to talk together more, not just kind of, you know, pick at what one doctor is doing versus the other or, you know, nitpick at that insurance company. Um, be prepared to sit down with people, um, quote unquote, across the table um, and, and, and make, some, make something happen, make some changes for the better. Do you see any, uh, anything happening at which you are encouraged in this, in this discussion? You know, the hearing that I went to was encouraging. The senators in our state on this specific committee, um, you know, all politics is local. Um, they, you know, they want to hear this and they want to listen to doctors. I think they understand that doctors have patients' interests in mind. And so legislators, they're going to listen to dollars and they're going to listen to the voices of their constituents. Um, physicians, we don't really have a calling card for, you know, whining about this stuff. You know, they aren't going to really take pity on, on physicians. Um, we're, you know, I think alone, physicians alone. But if we can combine it with patient stories and the ways that we're trying to save them dollars by not having their patients go to the ER for pain exacerbation and cost, you know, the employers who contribute to their political campaigns a lot more money, um, then that's the angle that I think we could take. And I think that's starting to work here and we're getting a good audience. So that is encouraging. Awesome. Um, are there any other important questions to address or facets of this issue that I haven't already asked about that it's worth, uh, worth mentioning? Right. I mean, I think we've addressed a lot of the reasons. Okay. We addressed the history of prior auth, you know, why it's important and what limitations it puts on care. But I think two things, the collaboration is important here. Let's not just call people out. Let's not just, you know, give the insurance company, that building behind the Senate building, a bad name. Um, I'm, I'm ready. I would love to walk in that building and have a productive conversation with people um, and, and understand because the funny thing is some of those people were doctors once themselves and cared for patients. So, yeah. you know, let's, let's, come together, you know, let's be collegial about it and, and, and make this happen. You know, the other thing too, is if, if you want to look at this one way, if you start with why quote unquote, it's Simon Sinek, he's a marketing yeah. guru. guru. Yep. Uh, I love that book. And, you know, you have to look at um, the values and the beliefs where people are coming from. Why are we doing this? Uh, from there, you can get out to the, how we go about this and then what we're trying to get against, but you know, the values of why are we in this? And, and doctors and patients, you know, we're here to help people, for me, get their life back, right? We want to help people function with chronic pain. I've heard directly from other companies who put out these guidelines that, you know, we don't do patient satisfaction. We don't do outcomes. We only do guidelines. So let's bring our whys together in a better way. And I think we need to do that across the table, across, you know, all these different things um, that involve parties uh, to make improvements here. That makes sense. And I'm curious to know what you think about this. I, I think that in this day and age, we are, we're just, at least this is, I, I think, there's all these big companies, the, the big social media and internet driven companies that their, their profitability is directly correlated with how divided and how fractioned and factioned yes. they can make yes. American citizens and the rest of the world. And so yes. there's incentive to just drive the wedge deeper and, yes. and make us more and more feel like we have an adversarial relationship with everyone because it makes us read the article and comment on the post and then they can sell us more ad dollars. I'm a bit of a, you know, a conspiracy theorist in these ways. And I just sure. see these relationships sure. and it's kind of, 
it's undeniable in my opinion. But anyway, sure. I think that one of the antidotes potentially to, I, I think this is an issue, you know, we can pit insurance and, and like doctors yes. against each other. It's like, oh, big bad insurance companies and greedy doctors right. and whatever. Right. I, I'm, I'm curious, do you, do you see any opportunities to build human connection across the aisle if we say the other side of the aisle is maybe the insurance industry are there are there people over there or are there discussions between physicians and insurance companies happening anywhere or could there be that that would help sort of break down the um the stereotype and the facade and say mm -hmm. human to human we all want to live in mm -hmm. a better world is there a way to right. is there a way that we can do that and like you said work together yeah. to be able to help progress yeah. Your, your image of driving a wedge is, is accurate because if you think about the physician and the patient, if there's a wedge of prior auth, that is a cost control for profit mechanism that the insurance company uses. So you're exactly right. That wedge there, if you take it from that really personal thing and then balloon it out to population, I think that's applicable. Um, and yes, there are opportunities to do this. I have a, There's a more local insurance company in our area. We meet with their senior vice president, medical officer, uh, about once every two to three months, just me and Dr. Javer here in the clinic, we talk about pain management and prior auth. And, you know, we feel really lucky to be able to do that and inform him. He was a previous doctor and even physician's assistant. And when that happens, man, it works really, really well. And it's really cool to see policy come out of those meetings. Um, the Centers for Medicaid and Medicare and Medicaid Services, um, Dr. Um, Singh, uh, Vima Singh, I think is her name. She's the administrator um, she put out an article recently about, you know, driving down cost and giving patients and doctors, you know, um, the chance to make their own choices in, medic in medical care. But she also said that, well, prior authorization is here, so we're going to make it electronic to make it more efficient. But, you know, it's still here. That was a little bit, you know, hypocritical to me. But in that article, she said, we've had over 2,000 people give comments at 35 listening sessions. So that was really encouraging. Hmm. The thing is, doctors and patients have to feel like we're having an impact and there's a foothold and that what we're going to say is going to be listened to and that we can find a middle ground here. Um, I've tried that, as I mentioned, at a different insurance company, took an evening with a lot of other doctors, and all we heard from was not even the insurance company, but that third party prior off saying, uh, this is the way it is. I'm sorry. So it can work. That sounds deeply frustrating. Very. That was an awful evening. <laughs> <sighs> um had another question that just slipped my mind oh mm -hmm. you mentioned something earlier that i wanted to come back around on the instances where there is a prior auth and then the treatment that gets approved ends up not being paid for by the insurance company can you talk a little bit about the circumstances surrounding that sure sure so there are a couple articles out there one's in jama network recently from earlier in february uh and there are instances also kaiser health news one of their recent articles if you search for this uh, there are patient stories out there, and, and this gets to conditions that are almost are more life and death, serious diseases. Pain is a problem, but these are even more serious in some ways where, and this is in the language of prior auth, an insurance company will say, your care is approved, but this is not a guarantee for payment. And so then they come back and say, well, you know, we're actually not going to pay for this. And those articles didn't tell me the specifics of why. Yeah. It's just that this is happening. And, you know, why, you can't say that, you know, this is not cost containment um, when all of a sudden you're, you know, asking for every procedure to be authorized. And then if you take it another step further and put that cost on the patient, as these articles are pointing out, um, that's egregious. And yeah. it's just obvious why we're doing these things. And we have to be able to make a better system, uh, primarily for patients, but also for the provision of healthcare in general. Yeah. Makes sense. So as you look to the future, um, you know, in the next, say, like uh, three to five years, Josh, and what yes. what kind of what kind of future do you envision for pain management physicians, for their patients, and and for healthcare more broadly? As hopefully we we continue to you know push back against these parts of the, I mean, healthcare is like big and confusing and mm -hmm. opaque. Mm -hmm. The more I, I consider myself pretty well versed, and the more mm -hmm. I dig into things, sometimes I just have to scratch my head and think, yeah. Is there is there literally anyone in America that knows enough about the big picture and cares enough yeah. to be able to to like productively improve this? Because I feel like there's so many stakeholders sure. and it's so you know, sure. uh, it, everyone's kind of pulling in opposite directions. But what do you think right. progress would look like? You know, in, into right. three to five years from now. 
Um, those dynamics will never change, of course. Yeah. But I think to make progress move forward, we need a few things. We need you know, physician collaborators and leaders who understand both sides of this, uh, advocacy, administration, clinical care, uh, and blending that in only a way that a physician can. Um, we have to understand that there will be population health guidelines that we operate by. We're okay with that. We want that. But have that be from our clinical societies. You know, let us argue that out and then give us the freedom to operate by those. But if not, say, hey, okay, this is why I think we need this unique thing because those are guidelines. They can't determine every patient situation. And then get physicians to the table to understand, okay, if your value-based practice maybe is a little more costly than someone else's, right? Don't say you can't give that care for three weeks and then potentially put the cost on the patient. Let's talk with doctors about what does that mean to operate within that system? I don't have those answers, but doctors need to be a part of that rather than just slapping a prior off seeming fix on this. And so in three to five years, if we can get to where physicians are at the table making more nuanced, the availability for more nuanced treatment options, we'll be successful. As long as we keep our why in front of us of mm -hmm. patient care, common values and beliefs, right? And as long as we collaborate, um, hey, I'm just as frustrated with you with insurance companies and all these things here. But at the end of the day, I have to remember too, they are people just like you and me, people, 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 as Brene Brown says, she's a great motivational, you know, motivational speaker, organizational development guru. We're all people, people, people. So if we can talk to each other that way, and I have to remind myself every time I post something on LinkedIn or talk about this, that's going to be a foundation where we can come up with common whys and values. And then the patient's really just going to benefit because we can deliver great care and we're going to get great outcomes, great satisfaction for great value. That's the triple aim of healthcare. Yeah. Well, I really appreciate the work that you're doing, not only for your patients, but to try to create a, a system that's functioning better on behalf of uh, everyone who, who's a participant in it. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. uh, sure Dr. Thing. Josh Suderman, thanks a lot for your time today on the mm -hmm. Anesthesia Success Podcast. Mm -hmm. Justin, it was great. Had a great time with you. Thanks for this opportunity. If you liked what you heard this week, head on over to anesthesiasuccess.com where you can find more content and free resources to help you build a successful career in anesthesiology and pain management. If you wanted to leave a review in iTunes, I would also really appreciate it. Thanks for using some of your valuable time to join me today on the Anesthesia Success Podcast.